So it's um, a great uh, pleasure to, uh, to continue this series of um, seminars, the European Tensor Network. And uh, we have tonight another distinguished speaker, Glenn Evenbly from uh, Georgia Tech. Um, he um, did his PhD with uh, Guy Frey Vidal and was instrumental in getting MERA, uh, the multi-scale entanglement randomization ansatz, uh, to get a numerical scheme working uh, for the MERA. And uh, since then, he has exploited this, uh, generalized this, and has done absolutely amazing things with, uh, with these tensor networks. And um, so um, today, he uh, will talk about pairwise tensor optimization for entanglement realization. So uh, Glenn, the stage is yours. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, yep. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, today, I'm going to commit the cardinal sin of talking about something before I finish writing up the paper. Um, there, there is a paper. It's almost done since May, but hopefully it will be done done very soon. Um, and so I thought today, since we're, we're in this virtual environment, it, um, it makes a lot of sense that there should be ads at the front of the talk, like, like any good online video. Um, so I'm going to just start off by giving a very quick introduction to this tensor trace program that I've developed. Okay, so this is some software. I started off as making a tool to make my own life easier, but then I thought it, um, other people might like to use it as well. Uh, so we're just going to do a very quick software demonstration. Let me pull this up. Please let me know if you can see this or you can't. Um, okay, so tensor Good trace is, is, is good. Okay, yeah. so it's basically a drawing app customized for tensor networks. So I can draw a tensor here. I can give it a name. Uh, let's call it A. So this is just some three index tensor. Let's make another one. We'll call it B and we'll do, okay. So hopefully this notation is very um, intuitive for people who use tensor networks. So if I connect one tensor to the next. So I have the second index of tensor A connects with the first index of tensor B. Um, so I can make these diagrams very easily. Okay, oops. So I have some open indices in my network. Um, okay, so this wouldn't be very useful if it was just a drawing program. However, uh, one of the features is you can do some sort of real-time analysis of this network. Okay, so I can see um, I can analyze the optimum way to contract the network. I can see the cost of doing it. I can see the scaling, the cost scaling in terms of the bond dimension. So this one scales as the fifth power of the bond dimension. Um, I can also export this code to my preferred programming language like Python or MATLAB. Um, Sorry, Glenn, I have a question. Does it automatically kind of take the optimal contraction in the sense that it minimizes it, it has the total built number of operations? That automatically figure out the optimal order. So if you have big networks with like more than a dozen tensors, this can take some time, but it, it has these solvers built into tensor trace itself. Glenn, can it be that we don't see the full of extent of your screen? Hmm? I don't see the full extent of your screen. I, I only see half, the upper half of your screen. Oh, I, I don't know how to fix that, Gifrey. Um, it works okay. here, so maybe there's something wrong with it. Yeah, the works work. here. OK, so some people complain, some people are fine. OK, too bad. OK, okay. well, this is going to be a short part of the talk anyway, so hopefully you can be better. Um, OK, so this is a very useful sort of real-time feedback tool for doing tensor networks. Um, Another way you can use tensor trace. Let me just pull it to the side. Um, so I have a code editor here on the right hand side now. And I can use another way of using tensor trace is I can select the network, I can copy, and I can paste it into my code editor, and it just writes the code for that network. Okay, and I like using it this way because uh, not only can you paste into code, you can take the code and you can paste back into tensor trace and it will recreate the diagram from the code. Okay, so this is super useful if you're like me and you've been working on some complicated code some time ago and you've completely forgotten what everything does. Um, you can say, select some complicated piece of code, 
copy and paste and you can see the network that it corresponds to and you can easily edit it and re-export re it back. Um, okay, so let me just do one final thing. So I just open the project file for um, the work I'm doing, I'm gonna be talking about today. So the, this, is, this represents about one quarter of the networks necessary to implement the algorithm I'm gonna be talking about today. So um, doing all of this by hand, doing like coding four times this amount of networks is not something you want to do. Um, you're probably gonna make mistakes. It's gonna take a long time. Uh, so the they whole idea of tensor traces is it makes stuff like this much easier. Okay, let's go back to the main talk. Okay, and so I'm, I'm currently working with Google to come up with a better version of TensorTrace with developed by people who are uh, more skills in software development than me. So if you have any ideas for features or improvements, uh, please let me know and we can try and uh, build them into a more professional version of TensorTrace. Um, I'll also take, uh, let me bring this up. Uh, does that look okay for everyone before we go on? It's good here. Looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me also advertise. So I've also been contributing to this Google Tensor Network Library. Um, so this is a library developed to do tensor networks, and they have a nice focus on, say, GPU and TPU hardware acceleration. Um, I've also been working with Martin Ganal, writing the symmetry version of this this library's code. Okay, so you can find that on GitHub. Uh, one of the focus for the symmetry library is the ability to do many index tensors very efficiently. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, already very nice symmetry toolboxes out there for tensor networks. Um, however, many of the exist existing toolboxes start having some sort of overheads and slowdowns once you want tensors with more than six or seven indices, okay? So we built this one from the ground up to be able to handle um, high, high demand or multi-index tensors very efficiently. Um, I also have my webpage, tensors.net, uh, with a bunch of tutorials and example codes there, um, if you're unaware of that. All right, um, adverts over, let's get started on the talk proper. Okay, so a key task in almost any tensor network algorithm is optimization. Okay, so we're given some tensor network, we have some variational parameters in this network. Uh, we may want to, for instance, optimize the variational parameters as to maximize the scalar product against some other wave function we have. We may want to um, maximize or minimize an expectation value with respect to an operator or a sum of operators. Um, and essentially, like most of our field is coming up with better ways to do these two operations and different ways of stringing these types of operations together. So regardless of whether you're finding ground or excited states or doing real or imaginary time evolutions, you're doing sort of some combination of these optimizations in general. Okay, so how do we do this optimization? We've got many tensors, each of them contain a whole bunch of parameters. Um, usually we just focus on one or two tensors at a time while the rest are held constant. Okay, so I select some hot tensor I'm going to uh, be manipulating while everything else is held fixed. Um, I can, could compute an environment of the, that encapsulates the rest of the network outside of this hot tensor. And I could use this environment to uh, figure out how I should change my tensor or the parameters contained in the tensor to, to do the optimization I want. And there are exactly what you're trying to do. Okay, so I thought I would just start off by going through um, a, an overview of how this works in respect to DMRG or the one site version of optimizing um, a matrix product state. Okay, so I start off, I have a matrix product state. I have an Hamiltonian represented as an MPO and I want to um, maximize or minimize the energy. Actually, can is my mouse pointer visible? Um, 
Can someone let me know, please? Yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Um, so I have, um, I've represented Psi H Psi. I've chosen my hot tensor. Um, the way I could proceed is I could compute this environment. Okay, so I just remove the tensor and its conjugate. Um, then I would solve the environment for its ground state eigenvector. And then I could just place this back into the matrix product state. Okay, so I've skimmed over a few details. You need to properly deal with the gauge degrees of freedom in the matrix product state, but this, this is the basic algorithm. And then you'd re repeat this procedure for all unique tensors in the network and then sweep over many of these iterations until everything is relatively converged. Okay, an alternative way of doing DMRG is rather than focusing on individual tensors, you focus on a pair of tensors together or you could, another way of thinking about it is I focus on the internal indices of the network. So I could choose some some link and to, so an internal index to focus on. I could compute the environment that I would get from re removing the pair of tensors connected to that link. Okay, so I get some environment that has uh, is between four and four indices. I would solve that environment for its ground state, but then I would have some additional step of taking a singular value decomposition to split this um, double tensor or to split this back into a pair of tensors, okay? And then once I have this pair, I can replace them back into my matrix product state. And again, I repeat this procedure for all of the unique links in the network. Okay, so, um, so that's a sort of very quick overview of two different ways of doing DMRG. So they usually call the one site and the two site algorithm. Okay, so the one site one is easier to implement and that you have less steps involved. Um, it's computationally cheaper to do per iteration uh, because the, the environment you're computing is, is smaller. Um, however, the, is known that the two site generally converges much faster, so less variational sweeps. Um, is generally less likely to get stuck in a local minima as well. Okay, so you can imagine like it's, it's sometimes a problem that you, you get stuck, you don't converge to the true minima you're trying to find. Um, and this is just more likely to happen with a one site algorithm. Okay, so there are many cases you can imagine where the one site derivative would be zero, but however, the, the two site derivative is, is non-zero. Okay, um, and there's a final point is that if I'm only changing one tensor at a time, then I'm not changing the index dimensions of the network. Um, or these, I, I would have to do something separate in order to change the actual indices themselves if I'm only changing individual tensors. So the two side algorithm can automatically adjust indices as well as the quantum numbers associated to indices if we're using symmetries. Um, so this point deserves a, a little bit more elaboration. Okay, so do, during the two side update, uh, the bond dimension can be adjusted to ensure that the truncation error is below some speci specified threshold. Okay, so I do the two side update. I have the singular value decomposition step. I can, um, I can keep as many singular values as I need to, to ensure I'm, I'm above some error threshold epsilon. Okay, um, and this is very nice is that I have some sort of smart way of updating the dimensions of my network to, to properly account for the simulation I'm doing. Okay, so if I'm doing, for instance, an inhomogeneous system, the bond dimension varies, uh, can, the, the amount of entanglement varies along the network, so I can sort of automatically choose the, uh, the minimal bond dimension I need in order to maintain some desired level of accuracy. So having, having this automation or having this smart uh, selection of smart index adjustment uh, is super useful. Um, and this is doubly so in the case I'm dealing with global symmetries. If I have, say, a U1 particle symmetry, then um, each index now comes with a set of quantum numbers that um, related to the symmetry. So, so the two-site algorithm can automatically pick out the optimal set of quantum numbers um, I need via, via the singular value decomposition. It, it comes for free. Okay, um, otherwise, if you're doing 
the one side update, this would be something you'd have to sort of figure out yourself or put in yourself or have some other means of determining these, these set of quantum numbers for the internal indices. Okay, so in practice, even though the two side algorithm is slightly more complicated and slightly more expensive, um, it turns out to be more often than not the preferred choice for how you should do things um, due to these advantages that I said. And I, I think it is sort of a big testament to Steve that like, um, that this, what I've described um, is, is very close to his original proposal. Like he, the thing he proposed like almost 30 years ago is still like essentially the optimal way of doing things, um, which is quite amazing. Okay, so, so given the advantages of a sort of pairwise update approach, um, could we think about doing this for general tensor networks? Okay, so if I just have some completely arbitrary tensor network, um, so I now focus on some link within the network, I now replace the pair of tensors connected by that link with a new tensor. Um, okay, and I choose that tensor as to minimize the energy of this state. And then I would have some additional step of trying to decompose that tensor back into a product of two, two new tensors. Okay. Um, and that should be done as to maximize the fidelity between the side prime and the side double prime, say. Okay, so in, in principle, all of this stuff is possible. Um, however, like the MPS, the matrix product state had a lot of things that simplified these steps that other networks don't have. So the drawbacks become much more severe. A general sort of two site algorithm becomes much, much more complicated than the single site and in general will, could be like plus plus more expensive as well. Okay, um, but today I'm gonna show how these sort of um, complicating factors can be overcome in the specific case we wanna deal with um, the mirror, this multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. Okay, so before we begin, I'll just give a very quick introduction to the mirror. Um, okay, so, we have a binary tree on the left. The mirror is just a tree that includes some extra connections between the branches. Okay, so we include some extra tensors we call disentanglers that link between the branches that would other um, of the tree. Okay, um, and it's an important consideration is that the tensors in the mirror are constrained uh, to be orthogonal. Okay, so a W dagger and a W these iso we call isometries, um, they have to cancel or annihilate to give the identity. A U dagger times a U should annihilate to give uh, two copies of the identity. Yeah, and these tensor constraints are, re like, um, impor are really important or um, necessary in order to be able to efficiently evaluate the expectation values from mirror. So if I don't have these constraints, then it's, it's not efficiently possible to exactly evaluate things from the mirror. Okay, uh, so let me just begin with a recap of how one might optimize a mirror using a single tensor scheme. Okay, so this was sort of uh, the first scheme I worked on with Giffray back in 2009. Um, so the scheme usually converges pretty well. Um, I actually remember uh, when I was working with Steve White's group, one day I was showing Steve like this simulation that was running and, and he made like just an off the cuff remark that, oh, it, it takes a lot of iterations to converge, doesn't it? Um, which, which, which hurt me deeply at the time, but it's very true that uh, the single tensor mirror uh, does take many iterations to converge. You're looking at sort of many thousands of sweeps um, although it does get there in the end. So, so anything we can do to improve that is, I think is certainly welcome. Um, and it can get trapped in local minima like all methods can, but again, it's generally pretty good and in, in, in not getting trapped. Okay, so how do we do this single tensor mirror? Okay, um, hey, so, so here I've just written the energy. So psi h psi. Um, as 
in terms of the tensor network. So this Hamiltonian H would be a sum of local terms, but I don't have to worry about that for schematic purposes. So if I focus on one particular layer that I want to optimize, um, this layer here, then the optimization can be reduced to, or the, the, the energy can be reduced to a set of simpler diagrams. Okay, so when I focus on one layer, I have some reduced density matrix. Okay, so this encodes the contributions coming from the higher layers of the mirror. Um, I have some effective Hamiltonian, which encodes the, the Hamiltonian passing through the lower layers of the mirror. Okay, so my, my environments for, for this one layer come from a set of these small diagrams. Okay. And then I can, if I want to evaluate a single tensor, I can do this trick of um, computing the, um, the, the, the single tensor environments. Okay, so here the energy for a single U, I've written out all of the contributions or all of the non-trivial contributions. Um, can, I, can I take the environment of the U and its conjugate together? Um, Unfortunately, the answer is generally no, in that taking uh, the network that I'll get from removing the U and its conjugate is very expensive. Um, so in practice, what we would do is take instead a linearized environment. Okay, so, um, so rather than removing U and U dagger, we just keep U dagger fixed and just remove the U part. Okay, so we're essentially linearizing a quadratic equation. Um, or a, something that's quadratic in U. And the idea is that if we were to solve this linearized version several times over, it should eventually converge to the optimal solution of the quadratic um, quadratic part. Okay, so just like solving the dominant eigenvector of a matrix via the power method. Okay, and then, um, so solving, once we have the lin linearized environment, solving for the optimal U that minimizes the energy is very straightforward. So we just, we want some tensor that contracts with the environment. Um, we want to maximize the negative of, of that, um, that scalar. Okay, and it turns out this, is, this has a known solution. Um, I should take the environment tensor. I should do the singular value decomposition or just orthogonalize it and set the singular values to unity. Um, and that's the optimal um, U, the, the, the optimal disentangler comes out from that, okay? Um, so, sorry, I'm getting a bit paranoid. Can people still hear me? Am I? Oh, yes, it's all good. We're good, okay. Yes, it's very hard to give these talks without any feedback from an audience. Um, so let's go on. Glenn, maybe I have a question. So why do you stress this, um, environment of both the tensor and its conjugate it's that this is too costly to compute what would you do with this or how is this different than, than with NPS it's the same right you also you cannot compute the full environment you only apply this environment and need to to apply Kirov method well like the, the energy depends on a u and a u dagger like um I mean, for, for the matrix product state, we do solve the, the one where we take out the thing from the bra and the kit. No, but then you plug in, well, you, you solve it via Krilov method. You don't construct this environment uh, as, a, as a dense matrix. That would also be too costly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I agree it doesn't. So solving the linearized environment several times is equivalent to solving the one, the quadratic one once. Um, I, I I agree. This this is not a big deal. This is this is perfectly fine, um, but um, to to find to define the optimal U tensor to put in, in the bra and the kit, we would need to solve. We would need to repeat this procedure several times over. Yeah, it's just that I mean, I thought the main distinction between the optimization you have to solve here and 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 the one with MPS and and the reason that you use a different approach is, is this orthogonality constraint. That that is not cost considerations. Well, it, I would say it's uh, it's both as well. Like ideally, if we could solve the quadratic equation once, then that would be um, 
that would be the pref preferred option. But yeah, the, the orthogonality constraints further complicate things. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks, Yudo. But actually, sorry, I also have a question about this. So if you would solve the quadratic problem without the orthogonality constraint and then take the some kind of an SVD of that solution, would that be the optimal um, U? Uh, I, I would not know how to. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it would be that easy. I think it's, it's more complicated than that, Frank. Um, Frank? Not according to, to our experience. So no, uh, I would say no, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's move on. So just a quick summary. So um, this basic approach, you compute the environment of a single tensor, you replace it uh, with the optimal tensor. And then if, we're, if we want translational invariance, we do another dubious step where we just replace this same tensor throughout the whole row. Um, so this is not strictly well justified, but in practice, it works very well. Um, and there are more sophisticated methods available for doing um, single tensor mirror. Um, so there's a talk on Monday by Marcus Hodu. Um, maybe someone can put a link to that in the chat, um, okay, where they use tangent space methods to, to uh, have, have an optimization that converges better. Um, and I view their work is something which could be complementary to the work discussed today. And, and in principle, you could put both things together that could have something that would um, work much, much better than the individual parts, maybe, hopefully. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to talk about um, how the single tensor mirror scheme can be generalized in order to have like a, a pairwise or a link based update algorithm. Okay, so first we're going to tackle the part of um, how we would actually do this before talking about the part of how expensive it is to do this and how, how we can do it efficiently. Okay, so the general strategy is now rather than focusing on tensors, we should focus on the links of the network. Okay, so in a binary mirror, we have three distinct types of link, which I've color coded and I've drawn the diagrams for how they appear. So we have ones that appear at the, as the central index of an isometry, and they can appear in different configurations depending on, and th there are some special ones that only occur at the top where they link to the top tensor. Um, there are also, also some left and right links coming out from the, um, the disentanglers and principles. And, and in principle, these could all be different dimensions and they could all be have different quantum numbers um, yeah, or at least um, if we're doing things in the most efficient way, then they should all be of different dimension. Okay, so we're going to focus on uh, this uh, this first case of the center links. Okay, um, okay, and and another um, restriction. So I want to do this in a way that's compatible with translation invariance. So rather than consider these two cases separately, um, I'm going to consider uh, this triplet of W, U, W together and try and update this in a way that's compatible with um, having um, each, each layer as an identical copy or of the same tensor. Okay, so here, um, so, so we have our mirror. Our first step is to compute the environment of this W, U, W um, triplet. So here is the set of diagrams you'd use to evaluate the environment from this. Um, Again, things, things are getting pretty complicated, but throw it in tensor trace and it's actually not too bad. And as I said, I'll talk about the cost of these later on. So we can compute the environment. We can do the same trick of um, replacing this triplet with a single tensor that um, optimally minimizes the energy. Uh, but now we need to decompose this, this Q tensor, as I call it, back into a product of a W, U, W tensor. Oh, set of tensors. Okay, so can I just take the SVD of this Q tensor? Um, no, I can't do that because I want to minimize the global error, not the local error um, of, of this truncation. So 
what I really want to do is do this decomposition in such a way that the fidelity between my original and my new network is, is maximized. Okay, so if I write this fidelity diagram and I simplify it, I get um, something like this. Okay, but, but this, this question of uh, this doing this decomposition as to maximize the fidelity, this is, this is something we know how to do and it's sort of the key idea that DMRG was originally based on is that we should choose this W as to preserve the support of the local reduced density matrix. Okay, so uh, very standard stuff. Um, I should, from, from this whole state, I should compute the output density matrix on the left two and the right two indices of this Q. Um, and here I take the average of these two density matrices because I want an isometry, I want to use the same isometry in both places to preserve translation invariance. Okay, so I take this density matrix, I do the eigen decomposition, I keep the span of the dominant eigenvectors and, and I call this my W. Okay, and so again, I um, can just absorb these into my Q tensor. And this is, this is my resulting um, new triplet of W, U, W. Okay, so it's actually uh, relatively straightforward to do this and I can uh, choose the new bond dimension in such a way to to keep some desired um, accuracy yeah so I can keep all eigen all eigenvalues above some cutoff threshold for instance okay so once I have my new triplet I can just replace it along the row as well okay so um, it's relatively straightforward so far I just have a um, Sorry, Glenn, I have a small question. So why are you guaranteed that what comes out is still a unitary? Uh, say that again, Frank. So why are you why are you guaranteed that your prime is still a unitary? Uh, so so in practice the you uh, in practice the U prime tensor. Um, well so so Q is isometric. So the U prime will be almost isometric up up to the areas associated with the truncation of the density matrix. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's, it's very close to being isometric, it's isometric to within my error, but I could just have a separate step where I reorthogonalize it and it's fine as well. Sure, okay. That makes sense. All right, good. Okay, um, and we can use a similar approach to do the top tensor again. So. I identify these pair, an isometry connected to the top tensor of the network. I find some optimal single tensor to replace this pair of tensors. I use the density matrix to optimally decompose this. And then I um, replace the isometry I've found throughout the row. And I can um, also can replace the top tensor with, um, once I've replaced the isometries, I can also find, update the top tensor as well. Okay, so um, in, in these situations, it's actually a very straightforward way of generalizing the single tensor mirror update to this pairwise update scheme. Um, so next, uh, we describe how to do it in the case where an isometry is connected to a disentangler um, in, in this more difficult configuration. So these left links, so again, if I'm computing the environment of this pair of tensors, um, I have some relatively simple diagrams I need to evaluate um, in order to get this environment of this WU pair. So can we follow the previous strategy of replacing this pair of tensors with a single tensor that minimizes the energy and then decomposing this back into uh, a pair of tensors um, and I would say this doesn't seem possible, or at least I don't know a good way of doing this directly. Um, I don't know a way of, there's no way of decomposing this Q tensor into an isometry and a like something which is orthogonal between two and two. Okay, so, so doing this directly in the most obvious way doesn't seem to be possible. Um, however, there is, it's, nice ways around this. Um, so th this bit is mainly for the experts um, as it gets pretty technical, but usually I think of 
usually these disentanglers can be allowed to map from some larger space to some smaller space or larger dimensions to some smaller dimension. However, another way of thinking of them is some purely unitary two-body gate followed by some isometries that map to a smaller space. Okay. And if I think about the tensors in this way as um, something purely unitary followed by an isometry, then what I'm going to do is replace this pair of tensors by um, a new pair of tensors W prime and U tilde prime. Okay, so these, this has the maximal dimension, uh, the maximal dimension link between them. So I can try and solve for the optimal W prime and U prime. Um, and I, I do this by uh, alternating single tensor updates, which makes it sound as though we're back to a single tensor scheme. Um, however, I, I would point out that the expensive part of this is computing the environment. And once you have this, it's very, very cheap to do this ultimate alternating step here. So I can just do a hundred iterations of this alternating scheme with neg neg negligible time. Okay, so once I have this optimal pair, then I do this additional step of um, computing the density matrix and solving um, diagonalizing for its optimal support um, in, in order to find the proper subspace that I should keep. Okay, so this is um, as encoded by this Y prime tensor, which just maps from the maximal dimension, dimensional space to this reduced dimensional space. Okay. Um, so again, here, um, here's an learn. overview of uh, what I just said. So I, I want to optimize a pair of tensors together. I solve the problem, um, the optimization where the index connecting them has been expanded to the maximum dimension possible uh, to be compatible with the isometric or with the orthogonality constraints on the tensors. Uh, once I've solved for this optimal pair, I then reduce this dimension back down to the minimum it needs to be in order to have the appropriate level of error. Okay, and then I can uh, replace these tensors along the row as usual. Okay, there's a okay. question by Matteo, maybe. So, yes, go ahead. Uh, so, um, Glenn, so, oh, blah, wait a second. Yes, so uh, why at all do you need to, to move back and forth with these um, um, isometries to, so the, the green ones, Mm -hmm. to become isometries and then unitaries and the backward. I mean, so you could absorb everything into the orange ones and consider them to be isometries and the other as unitaries as, as in the original proposal by Giffrey. So where, where yes, is the, that, where is the is advantage in the, in the computational? That, that is a very good question. And the reason we do this is, um, okay, so I've described the scheme for updating all of the different links. Um, so the reason we didn't just absorb it and to begin with is doing it the way I described allows the, the internal index to be adjusted in some smart way. Okay, so the, the, the final dimension of the index that we get comes from an eigen decomposition of a density matrix. So if um, I can change the dimension and change the quantum numbers on that index from, from what it was in some automated way, okay, which I wouldn't get if it was just absorbed in the tensor to begin with. Thanks. Okay, so, so in all cases, um, each time I do an iteration, all of the internal indices are given by some eigen decomposition of a local reduced density matrix, okay, so very close to um, Steve White's original way of thinking about things where um, we should use, we should consult the density matrix to figure out what is the optimal subspace to keep. So we're doing that on each index in the network. Um, so the algorithm can automatically adjust all of the dimensions to maintain some desired level of accuracy in terms of truncation error. Um, and it can also automatically um, update or choose the optimal quantum numbers on each index, okay? What's the time? Okay, so, 
So that was, um, that was the part of how you actually do this new algorithm. So I'll talk briefly about the costs associated with doing these steps. Okay, so an ordinary binary mirror has a cost scaling um, bond dimension to the power of nine. If we just, just for simplicity, assume all of the dimensions um, uh, are the same chi. Okay, and, and um, if, we, if we're proposing a new method, we really want it to have the same cost scaling. So I don't care if I increase the cost by some constant factor, but if I increase it by a factor of chi, then that's pretty bad. Um, however, it turns out that most of the networks I need to compute are exactly the same cost scaling as, as previous. Um, so this may seem weird to you, but um, there are reasons for this. So one reason is that I haven't changed the mirror itself. So the, the causal cone of the mirror the, is still exactly the same. Um, and many of, these many of these pairwise environments that I need to evaluate, um, I would all already be already arise as the intermediate steps in the evaluation of the single tensor environments. Okay, so most of them I don't have to worry about. However, there are a couple of the diagrams that are pushed up to chi to the power of 10 scaling. Okay, so ideally you want to do something to reduce that back down to the same scaling we had previously. Um, and there are some pretty standard or routine ways of uh, doing this. Okay, so again, I'm just gonna be relatively quick here uh, because this is, as I said, a, a relatively standard thing. So how I re will reduce the scaling is to introduce some isometry, which compresses two chi-dimensional indices back down to an index, which is order chi still. Okay, so why does this work? Well, it's just an entanglement argument. Um, the entanglements of, of scales logarithmically in the number of sites, and this is true at any level of the mirror, or, or this is the maximum it can scale. So if I put two indices, two neighboring indices together, then um, I don't need chi-squared values to maintain the same error. I need something which is just proportional to chi again. Okay, so maybe it's two chi or three chi, but it's, it's certainly much less than chi-squared. Um, so it, it works, and in practice, um, in order to find this isometry, I'm just diagonalizing a density matrix and keeping the span of the dominant eigenvectors. Um, so doing this is, is very easy and in practice it works very well. Okay, so the final result is we have an algorithm where all of the networks have the same cost scaling as the original binary mirror algorithm. Um, in practice, each iteration of the pairwise scheme takes around two or three times longer than the single tensor update scheme. Um, however, this is independent of chi, okay? So whether you're doing chi equals four or chi equals 20, it's still roughly just two or three times longer. Okay, so um, as I said, the, um, in, in going to a pairwise scheme, the complications become much more significant. Um, the cost is also something you have to worry about, but these are surmountable issues. We can, we can get around them. Okay, so now I can show you some numeric results, convince you that this works and this has some uh, tan tangible advantages. Okay, so I just have some basic results that are still being compiled for the paper. Okay, but however, here we have a critical icing model. So our usual test model, we have a small bond dimension mirror and we're just comparing um, the, the energy of the state we have or the as compared to the exact energy, so the energy error as a function of um, how many optimization sweeps we've done. Okay, and this, this is a logarithmic scale on the optimization sweeps. So you can see um, the pairwise converges much faster. Um, and because it's a logarithmic scale, we're comparing like a few hundred sweeps to a few thousand sweeps in places. So there's quite a significant improvement in reducing the number of sweeps you need. Um, as you would expect from a pairwise update scheme. And if I plot the same data, but on the x-axis, I plot the time taken to compute. So taking into account that the pairwise update takes longer per iteration, 
um, I still see that I have some significant improvement in, in, in efficiency. So 200 seconds versus 600. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's a factor of two or three faster overall in general. And, and these results seem to be uh, roughly true for different models and different situations as well. And so, um, so we have these very tangible advantages of a pairwise scheme, uh, fewer iterations to converge, less time to converge. Um, it's also in general, it seems to be less likely to be trapped in a local minima. Okay, so this is something which is hard to quantify in terms of data, but just through my own experimentation, um, the, the times where it gets stuck in an in, in a excited state or is stuck in some quasi-stable higher energy state seems to be less when dealing with the pairwise update scheme. Okay, uh, but one of the big advantages is when we start doing um, symmetries. So again, this is a just a very quick simulation of using the XX model uh, for 1D uh, where we're using U1 symmetry um, using this tensor network block sparse library. Okay, so what I've done here is I've just started some small bond dimension calculation and just let it run where I, I and I let the, the algorithm itself uh, increase and change the bond dimensions and figure out the quantum numbers. I let it do all of this on its own. So usually, if I was doing a single tensor scheme, this would be something you'd have to put in manually. You'd have to stop the calculation and look and try and figure out how to expand the quantum numbers, how to expand which bond dimensions where, um, and it would be a lot of work. So here is um, just a very nice way where you can just let it run and go play video games for a few hours and come back and it's um, done and it's all good. Um, and it has this sort of staircase in the convergence. Uh, this is just because I, I limited the I limited the, the steps where it was allowed to increase the bond dimension to once every 100 iterations, just to um, just makes it slightly more stable if you enforce it to do some iterations between where it can increase the bond dimensions. Okay, and as I said, um, if you look at the final result. Um, you can like look at the quantum numbers on an index. So these are the, the spin quantum numbers. Um, so you see you have the highest degeneracy in the spin zero sector and some as we go to, um, and some symmetry between the negative and the positive spin and it diminishes you as you go to higher magnitude spins. Okay, so this is something which you could probably guess for this model, uh, but this is something that I didn't put in myself that this is something that the algorithm produced on its own. Okay, and this is, um, once we start going to more complicated situations, um, this type of automation will be um, essential. Okay, so, so there are some nice efficiency gains for doing a pairwise method. However, the most significant advantages are this smart update of the index dimensions and the quantum numbers. Okay, so being able to deal with, um, in, in a situation, for instance, if I had multiple U1 symmetries like U1 particle number and U1 spin symmetry, then this is not something I'm going to be able to figure out what quantum numbers to use on my own. Okay, or if I was doing time evolution or if I had a spatially inhomogeneous system. Okay, so if the, if the index dimensions and the quantum numbers can vary in space or in time, then this is not something you're able to to do manually. This is something you want to be able to automate, okay? And so this is sort of the most tangible advantage of this pairwise scheme and that it can automate choosing the optimal bond dimensions and choosing the quantum numbers associated to them. Okay, and as I said, I focused on the mirror today, but I think this type of idea could very easily be applied to um, any geometry tensor network. Okay, um, thanks for your attention and start with questions. So thanks a lot, Glenn, for this uh, this very pedagogical and nice talk. Um, are there questions from the audience? I could ask one. Uh, you were doing binary mirror specifically for, for this one. Mm -hmm. Have you have you checked whether this can also be done with the same cost as, as the usual single site 
or single tensor update for for something like ternary or modified binary? Um, I haven't looked at it explicitly. Um, I mean, I think in, in general, um, as I said, the fact that the causal cone is still the same um, has a big, I think in, in almost any mirror you can think of, most of the diagrams are going to be the same cost because as I said, these would like the pairwise environment would just be the intermediate step in computing the single environment. Um, However, I would also assume there's maybe a couple of diagrams which are some higher order which you need to properly deal with or have some, as I said, have some smart approximation as I um, introduce. So uh, a similar question, Glenn. So, so the, the 2020s is a new decade. So I guess that, that Mera has to enter the realm of 2D, uh, tensor, 2, 2D systems. So, so, so what is the cost? Uh, if you do this for a two-dimensional spin system? Um, I, I don't know, but again, I think the, the general limiting factor of a mirror is dealing with the causal cone. Um, and this doesn't change what the causal cone is. You just have to compute a double, like, and, and I mean, as a, as a general principle, computing the environment of two neighboring tensors from the same network is not usually much more expensive than computing the one one tense environment. So I think um, again, especially if you're if you're allowed to use the same sort of tricks as as I use here, which work very well, then um, this this should not increase the scaling that we would expect from um, the single tensor update scheme for two D mirror. Uh, but that's uh, that's not saying much. The 2D mirror single tensor update is already too expensive. Um, so, so you may you may need better ways of doing everything in general. Yeah. Glenn, can you remind us how expensive the 2D mirror is? Um, it depends on how you do it, but generally around uh, bond dimensions, the power of fourteen. Um, so bond dimensions past six become very challenging. Um, and is, is there a notion that one dimension you need in higher dimensions is smaller hmm? than the ones you need in one dimension for the similar accuracy or? or? Sure, it's, I mean, it's like, like the comparison between MPS and PEPS where it's certainly the case where the 2D bond dimension doesn't, um, well, it's a bit different, though, because in, in, in a PEPS, you, you actually get, of course, an exponential amount of, of the, the, the number of degrees of freedom. It grows exponentially with, with the number of legs you have, while, while in a mirror, that's not necessarily true. Um, I, well, I mean, it's still... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's the... I wouldn't say it's the number of degrees of freedom. It's more about the entanglement of... 2D versus 1D is the yeah. is, is the main thing. So Glenn, to summarize, how many so you explain the different advantages mm -hmm. of this to to tensor update, but in the end, uh, you said that it was faster overall. The new approach is faster per iteration. Mm -hmm. or faster to get to the ground state? Which which one was it? Uh, the new approach. No, it was two times slower per iteration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so slower per iteration, but overall faster to the ground state. Um, I see. So it, it, you have to iterate less times. So this all started, as you explained, because Steve White heard your feelings. So um, I would like to hear <laughs> If, if right, Steve, could you tell him to to work on the two-dimensional case a bit more? Can you hurt him his feelings in that direction? <laughs> yes, we need your we need your brilliance, Glenn, for the two D. Mm -hmm. hey, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I think a slightly more insulting statement was called for him. <laughs> Yeah, Steve. You, Steve could just should just say something like, "Oh, 2D doesn't seem that hard." Like, 
Oh, but the best motivation is to say that it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> then you will you will try to prove Steve wrong. No. <laughs> nope. Yeah. So I mean, I think like the the results I have here are pretty consistent with like what Steve, like the comparison between one D one side and two side DMRG, where it, it can two side converges faster. And even taking into account two-site DMRG is slightly more expensive. It still has some overall efficiency gain, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, so Glenn, I'm I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, we we applied Mira to, to constructing wavelets. Mm -hmm. Have you thought at all about what you can do in terms of? You know, we certainly had slow optimization in getting good wavelets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, things are different here, you know, you don't, you're not as, the scaling doesn't go the same way, mm -hmm. but uh, you might get similar improvements. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know how to, how, how to do it for that case, but yeah, I mean, yeah, may, maybe something could be done for that kind of optimization too. Um, A small question is this is the code to do this is this uh, like freely available do you have like um i'm going to your website to do all these things or or is this something that is uh, once once oh. it's done i'm i'm going to put it on my tensors.net is my ambition to to keep putting my codes there um however at the moment um i'm still working with martin like there's still being changes made to the block sparse toolbox that we use so um so the, the the final code will um, can't be available yet because the block sparse toolbox is still changing in some of the syntax and that. So w once we have that finalized, then I'll be able to make the code available very easily. Glenn, mm -hmm. one question on the slide you you just have on. So. Uh, when you say critical uh, Ising model, so what sites should I understand? So is that already the infinite algorithm or is that for uh, finite sites? Just to gauge a little bit the numbers of-, of uh, Yeah, the, the numbers is just a finite size with maybe a few hundred sites or something just to, um, I mean, it, it could have been the scale and varying case or something else. It's, it's mm -hmm. not super important and it, it look, it, all of the tests I've done look relatively similar, um, at least in this comparison between the two methods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that would have been the next question. What the site's influence was, but, but you already answered. So. So can you also use these tricks um, to in, in, in this whole TNR setting that you developed a few years ago? Uh, multiple tensors um, pro probably um, yeah I, I don't see why not um, yeah I, th I think that was slightly different in that when you're doing TNR or TRG um, you, you have available very nice ways of guessing what quantum numbers you should use or like it, you can you can you can get them very easily from looking at the singular value decomposition of the partition function tensors. If you're doing variational energy minimization, you have less um, less available to try and figure out what the quantum numbers on the internal indices should be. And actually, I have, sorry, I have another question. So, so I think the the main reason that people love the two side DMRG of Steve White so much is that it gives you direct access to this truncation error. And it gives you an idea how good you are, how far you are. Is there kind of a similar measure of error that you get out of your construction? Yeah, that, that's, um, we get exactly the same measure of error where, I mean, at every step, we, at every step when we update a tensor or at every sweep, we look over every index of the network and it, it comes from there is an associated density matrix that we've diagonalized. So with every index of the network, we have some idea of the truncation error associated to that index. 
Okay, and that's sort of, the, as I said, it's a very nice thing in that I could like just set, like I want to maintain some error below some threshold and the algorithm will automatically choose the minimal bond dimension it needs throughout the network in order to maintain that level of truncation error. And, and this accuracy epsilon, how does it scale with the bond dimension in practice? Um, well, that, that's a, a physics question. Um, I mean, it's, you're, you're, you're asking about uh, how the, the spectrum of the, um, how, how the number of Schmidt values above some epsilon scales with the critical icing model as a function of like block size. Is. But is it clear what the meaning is actually of these eigenvalues? It's not just the Schmidt numbers, no, they are. It's, it's, I mean, it's directly a density, like it's the eigenvalues of a density matrix on, on that layer of the mirror. Um, so I agree it's not, it's not, super clear how this relates to the um, the ov overall truncation error or maybe it is um, I, I mean you, you are really like it's really effectively asking the question like um, given I were to change some index in the middle of the mirror um, what is the size of the like what is the size of the error in the overall density matrix I'm incurring? I think it's, you could make an argument that these, that it is exactly that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think uh, we should thank Glenn again for this uh, very nice talk. And uh, I also want to thank the audience for uh, being back. So we will try to have a seminar every two weeks from now on. And- um, Frank, can I add something? Yes. Can I ask something? Sorry, uh, Glenn. I, I don't really understand this last statement because if I think of uh, of uh, the reduced density matrix of a link at a given level as the um, reduced density matrix back on the chain at a certain length, I would expect that then uh, the the deeper you go on up to your main, uh, the larger the um, the block is. And since we know how the uh, eigenvalues scale with the size of the block. Uh, then I would expect that you would need larger and larger bond dimension. Um, so it's not a single link that, that provides a reduced density matrix or full block, right? Uh, you have disentangled a lot of uh, short distance things. Well, I was thinking in terms of truncation error with an individual link, like I was, again, maybe, maybe my quick argument is wrong, but I was thinking like, well, everything below that link in the mirror is essentially like some unitary transformation of the basis. So an error incurred in the middle of the mirror is still like, it's related to the error I would get in the, the final state in some very direct way. Yes, what I was uh, maybe questioning is the fact that knowing how the eigenvalue of the reduced density matrix go with the size of the block tells okay. you something about uh, yeah, I think I see what you're saying. So if I'm just looking at a local reduced density matrix at the bottom of the mirror, clearly the layers closer to the bottom, the truncation yes. there has a bigger effect on this than the ones from higher, which, yes. which I agree. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyway, so if there's no more questions, let's thank Glenn again. Um, let's see each other in two weeks, same time, everywhere in the world. Thanks, Glenn. Right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.